So my name is Alex Sutteroff, and okay, basically we're teaching computers 101. So now that we can advance to uh, the next slide, let's <laughs> find out what's there. Um, I had a little introductory section that I'm going to breeze through very quickly because we're kind of short on time. Um, so reverse engineering is the process of taking an application or a uh, process or some kind of network traffic or you know, anything else that you can observe about a computer system and figure out how the computer system works um, without necessarily having access to its source code, documentation, uh, design, and so on. Um, so it is widely used uh, for various uh, nefarious purposes in the computer underground. Um, people use it to crack copy protections, develop exploits, uh, operating system reversing. It is also used in the security industry pretty heavily. Um, a lot of uh, products like antivirus are based on reverse engineering samples of malware day after day after day. Um, also, uh, a lot of big security companies have to reverse engineer patches, reverse engineer uh, various attack tools uh, to understand how they work and be able to stop them and so on. So, uh, the goal for uh, this class is to do a very brief introduction to reverse engineering to show you what it looks like. Uh, and we're going to take a uh, very simple program written in C, uh, compiled as an executable file on Windows. And we're going to uh, look at that program and uh, figure out what it does and uh, kind of recreate its uh, source code. Not completely because you can't really do this in like a single hour, but I will show you the steps that you have to take. Uh, and if you're, uh, if you're interested, you know, you can take this, you can take this home and you can do a little bit more work and actually get the source code of the uh, program out. So we'll start with a uh, brief introduction to x86 assembly. Now this is uh, crucial because when you don't have the source code to a program, the only thing that you're going to have is the machine instructions. So, a uh, x86 CPU, which is what all of these computers have, uh, has its main memory, uh, which is split into the stack and the heap for the uh, data that the application uses, uh, and then the code of the program. The stack is used for local variables, in C, uh, the heap is used for anything allocated with the uh, C malloc and free functions. Uh, you have registers. Uh, the registers are uh, single uh, single elements of the CPU that store uh, values. Uh, they're 32-bit long, so they can only store one 32-bit integer in each register. Uh, you have the uh, EBP and ESP registers, which usually point to the stack. ESP is the stack pointer. It uh, shows you where the end of the the current the current end of the stack is. So when you add data on the stack, the ESP uh, register kind of moves down, and then when you remove data from the stack, it moves up. Uh, EIP is the uh, instruction pointer. It always points to the instruction that is currently being executed. So if you have any jumps or if you call a function, the instruction pointer is going to move to the instructions of that function. And then you have uh, the general purpose registers, um, which are listed here. Uh, those, registers, uh, those registers are just used by the program to, 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 store, uh, to, to store temporary values and operate on them. Uh, then you have some, so what are, what are these operations? You can do arithmetic instructions uh, where you load a constant into one of the registers uh, and then you can add registers together or you can subtract them. So these instructions here um, load the value 2 into EAX, 3 into EBX, then add them together. Uh, notice that when you add them together uh, there's only two arguments to the add instruction, uh, EX and EBX. This is because the first argument serves both as an argument to the addition and also the destination where the, uh, where, where, where the result is stored. 
So this is basically equivalent to a plus equals operator from C. Uh, and then at the bottom there you have a sub instruction that just subtracts uh, an integer from the register. Uh, this is all good, but if you need to work with more data than you can store in the registers, uh, which is very limited because there's only like eight registers, you need to store uh, the extra values that you're going to operate on in memory. And to use them, you have a series of instructions for loading and storing data in memory. So you, can, you, you cannot usually operate with the data in the memory directly. You have to load it into the register, then perform the operations on the registers, and then maybe store the result back into the memory. Uh, so here you have the instructions for uh, loading, loading the contents uh, from some address in memory, and then uh, storing storing the contents of a register in that place in memory. Next, we have uh, conditional branches. So if your program has any loops, uh, they're going to be implemented using branches like this. So uh, you have instructions like CMP, which just compares two arguments. Uh, and then based on the result, uh, you have a set of conditional jump instructions, uh, which perform a jump somewhere else in the program if the, two, if the two arguments were equal, or if one was greater than the other, or less than the other, uh, or less than or equal, and uh, so on. And finally, you have the jump instruction, which does an unconditional jump. So that's the equivalent of go to in C. Then, if you have a function, uh, you would call it with a call instruction. So here's the call instruction. And then when the function is executed, uh, usually the function will save some of, the, some of the registers onto the stack. And then when it, finishes, uh, when it finishes doing whatever the function does, it would restore those registers. Uh, this is so that the code can assume that when a function is called, uh, those registers like ESI are not modified by the function. So uh, you can, be, be, because the code always shares the same register. So when you call a function, you don't want that function to mess up the uh, contents of the registers that you have before you call the function. And then finally, at the end of the function, uh, the function executes a return instruction, which uh, reads the return address from the stack and jumps back to it. So uh, that executes a return back to the place where uh, the call instruction was. OK. Um, So I'm going to go through this section really quickly, too, because uh, it's kind of long, and it's not that important for understanding the, uh, for understanding the program that we're going to look at later. Uh, this is mostly background information, uh, but I want to get you guys uh, into the IDA disassembler as quickly as possible so we can spend more time there, because that would be more, um, that would be easier to understand than just like the dry lecturing slides. So. The instructions that you're going to see, uh, the assembly instructions that you're going to see in the program, do not correspond to the C source code directly. Uh, this is because the compiler takes the C code and then it performs optimizations on it. And those optimizations um, have the effect of modifying the form of the code a little bit without modifying its, uh, its, its, its operation. So the code still does the same operations, but it just does them more efficiently. Um, so for example, one of the uh, optimizations is inlining. So here we have some C code uh, that has a function called foo that just adds its two arguments, and then we call it. So when the, when the compiler sees this, it has, uh, if, if, if it's not an optimizing compiler, then it's going to create a separate, a separate function and then it's going to call that function, and then the function will add the two arguments and then return. But the calling and returning from the function uh, take precious CPU cycles. So because the body of the function is so simple, the compiler can just put it in the place where the call happened. Uh, it can replace that call with just the addition. So uh, it doesn't need to create a separate body of the function. So if this function is called from a few different places, the compiler is just going to copy it in all of those places. 
Obviously, that expands the size of the code, but uh, for something as simple as this, that's not a problem. Uh, it's not important. Not important. Uh, this one is kind of important. So, uh, in this optimization called common sub expression elimination, uh, that's a compiler theory term. So, if you like, you don't really you don't really need to care about what the optimizations are called. You just need to be aware of them so that when you see the results in the assembly code of a program, you can kind of imagine what the compiler did to get to 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 get to that uh, to get to that point from the C code. Um, so here we have two uh, two variables a and p. They're both computed using somewhat complicated expression, but the uh, z plus one. Uh, term there is the same in both. So the compiler will notice this and instead of uh, instead of computing it twice it will compute z plus one the first time it will store it in a temporary variable. Uh, this can be a variable in memory uh, or it can be a register um, and then after this when it computes a and p it will uh, use that temporary variable. So oh. Yeah, there's a there's a bug there. There, this z should be uh, temp. Sorry about that. But you caught it, which means that you uh, understood the optimization. Uh, then sometimes the compiler completely removes uh, removes part of your code because they're not necessary. Uh, for example, here uh, the compiler can very easily detect that uh, the value of b is always going to be nine because it's based on the same operations. Nothing, like nothing is going to change at runtime. So uh, it, can, it can just replace all of these calculations with a call to func with uh, the argument nine. Uh, sometimes you're gonna have entire chunks of code that are missing because the compiler proved that they can never be executed. Uh, so here, for example, we have uh, a check if A is less than zero but right above it, we assigned one to A. So the compiler will see that A is always one, so this code can never be executed, and the compiler will not output this code in the, uh, in the program at all, because it's not necessary. Uh, another thing that you're gonna see very often uh, is how the compiler replaces some calculations with more efficient forms of the same calculations. For example, instead of uh, multiplying a value by 15, the compiler is going to uh, shift that value by four uh, and then subtract the same value. Uh, shifting it by four uh, uh, is, is equivalent to multiplying it by 16 uh, because uh, that's how binary arithmetic works. And then when we subtract the value of x again, uh, the end result is x times 15. So you're often going to, see, like in, in, in the program, you're often going to see uh, slightly complicated operations that look kind of like this. And you're going to scratch your head because no programmer would ever you know, write something as complicated as this to, to, to compute something very simple. Uh, but Perhaps the programmer actually wrote the simple version, but the compiler made it a little bit more complicated because it was able to compute it more efficiently. And this version here is faster because um, multiplying two values on, on a modern CPU takes like a bunch of CPU cycles, but simply shifting it by four is like instantaneous. You can do it in like a single clock cycle. All right, and then Probably the most important thing that you have to be aware of is that the variables that you're going to see uh, on the stack of a program do not necessarily correspond to the variables uh, in the C code. So you can have some C, you can have a C function that has five variables, but maybe only two of those variables are used at a time. Like maybe the program first uses the first two variables, and then after this, it only uses the other two variables. So the compiler will notice this, and to save stack space and to reduce the 
amount of memory that the program needs. It's, go it, it's going to combine these two variables and keep them in the same place in memory. And this is okay because uh, the af because after the code uses the first two variables, um, their their values will not be needed again. So those places in memory can be overwritten with the values of the other two variables. Um, so usually what you're going to get, if you're doing decompilation, where you take a, uh, the binary code of a program and you kind of convert it back to C code manually, uh, you're going to end up with C code that is slightly different from the original C code that uh, the programmer wrote. But it's going to have a it's going to have the same uh, end result if your decompilation is correct. So there can be multiple forms of the code. All of them are correct, but some of them are maybe easier to understand when you read them than others. So as you do this more and more, you're just you're, you're going to get better at converting the more complicated uh, structures that the compiler output output it into more readable, uh, more human readable code that looks closer to C code that you might be familiar with. Oh, and then uh, finally, sometimes uh, the in the CPU there are a lot of weird effects and dependencies that happen between different instructions. So sometimes changing the order of two instructions will make the program run faster uh, because the same uh, because the CPU, the CPU units that perform the calculations can, can run in parallel. Uh, so, for example, I mean, obviously this can, this can be done uh, only if the instructions that you are changing the order of don't depend on each other. Like, if you need the first instruction to calculate something and then use it in the second instruction, there's no, there's no way around it. You have to do the first instruction first. But if you're computing two things that are not dependent on each other, then you can do that in any order you want. So the compiler, in that case, will choose the order that results in the fastest operation of the program. So here you have uh, two, two, two assembly sequences that are equivalent, but one of them will be slightly faster. So here we're loading a value from memory into EX and then adding one to it. And then underneath that, we load a value from, e from EDI into EDX and then add one to it as well. So these loads, the memory loads, are usually pretty slow on the CPU because it has to uh, talk to the RAM to get the uh, to get the right value, and this takes a bunch of clock cycles. So the CPU will work faster if you do the two loads together first, and then after that you do the two additions and these two sequences are, you know, they compute the exact same results. Uh, so again, when you see this in a, uh, in a binary program, it doesn't mean that the programmer wrote the uh, memory references in that order. Maybe the compiler put them in that order because they're faster. So the main tool for reverse engineering binary programs is uh, the disassembler called IDA Pro. Uh, this disassembler has been in existence for almost 20 years now. It is very uh, full featured and you know, has a very long history of development. Uh, you can download the free version, uh, which is somewhat limited in what it can do, but it's perfectly adequate for uh, all of your needs in this class. Um, it used to have almost no official documentation, but now there is a very good book about this disassembler called the IDA Pro Book. Very, very imaginative title. Um, I highly recommend you buy this book if you want to do anything more serious with uh, using the disassembler. It is the best documentation that is available about it. But who needs documentation? We're just going to jump into it and we'll see what it looks like. And I will, uh, I, will, I will open a simple executable that I built earlier today, and uh, I will show you how we're going to figure out what the executable does without having source code.
the more eyes on the progress bar, the faster it goes. So thank you all. I hope everyone can see there in the back row. And it looks like we're still recording. Okay, so uh, this is a Windows VM, and I have IDA installed in it. Uh, IDA actually has uh, OS X and Linux versions uh, as well, but I'm going to use the Windows one. So uh, I build a simple executable here. It's a very, very small one, six, six kilobytes. It doesn't really do much. Uh, it's built with uh, Visual C uh, 2008. So uh, to open it with IDA, I will drag it into IDA. This will start the program. So there's an option that I'm going to disable temporarily. So this is what the IDA main window looks like. Um, it looks a little bit better if you have a bigger screen. Uh, than this, but this is this is still enough for a demo. So we have a few different views. Uh, we have the IDA view that shows you the disassembled program code. So here we have a call instruction, then we have a jump instruction, uh, and then the jump instruction goes down there to this block, and then it continues executing through here. Then here we have a here we have a loop. So this instruction gets executed. This is a conditional. So we have a JZ instruction that's a conditional instruction. And it goes either down here or down here. So you can kind of follow the, uh, follow the code. You also have uh, a, few different, a few different windows. The one that is interesting to us right now is the imports view. So this shows you all the functions that this program imports from the Windows DLLs. And usually you can look through the imports and kind of see what the program does. So most of these imports are just kind of standard. Uh, you're going to see them in every program. Um, but the more interesting ones are sprintf, uh, string length. So these two imports uh, mean that the program does some kind of uh, C string manipulation. And then also uh, we see a bunch of imports from the WS232 library, which is the WinSock library that contains all the networking code. So we have we we, we import the functions uh, socket, bind, listen, accept, receive, send. So just from this window, you can tell that the program uh, listens on a network port, accepts connections, and then sends and receives data. So uh, on the side here, you have uh, a list of all the functions that IDA has identified in this program. And most of these functions uh, don't have specific names. They're just named after the address in the, in the program where the function code is found. Uh, this is because all the, mo all the names are lost when the program is compiled into an executable. Uh, but we can guess that the code we're interested in is going to be the code that calls the networking functions. So let's go to the uh, listen function. I'm going to double click on it. And actually I'll close this to make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so this is the listen function. It is imported from uh, it is imported from one of the Windows libraries. Uh, 
if I press Control X, this will give me a list of cross references to this function. So it'll give me all the locations where the program uses this particular uh, this particular function. There's only one such location, and that is uh, here. So here we have a function called Listen uh, that jumps to this import. So we're going to press Control X here as well to see who calls it, and we see that we have one call from this particular sub subroutine. So we're going to go there, and it highlights the uh, call to listen. So uh, now we know that this function is the one that performs the uh, networking, networking stuff. So let's call it a uh, interesting funk. So you just saw something very important. In IDA, you can rename any of the pieces of the program that it shows you. You can rename the function names. You can rename variable names. Uh, you can also create comments. So you can interactively add more information to the disassembly to make it more uh, clear what the disassembly does, what, what the program does. So as your understanding of the program increases, uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can add this understanding into IDA. And IDA will make the rest of the disassembly easier to understand as well. So uh, now that we've renamed the function, I'm going to press Control X again to see the cross references. And I see that it's being called here. And it's actually being called from a function called start. Uh, this function is called start because that is the entry point of the executable. So Ida knew that that was the entry point and named it start. Uh, and then we named interesting func ourselves. So now uh, Ida reflects this in the disassembly. So if you're somewhere else in the program and you're just reading some code, you're going to see a call to interesting func, and this will tell you, oh, I have seen this function again. I know what it does. I gave it this name. So uh, it'll make it easier to understand why it's being called. So the uh, interesting func is most likely the main function of the, uh, of the executable because we have uh, the start function that calls this one, and this one does all the, all, all, all the, all the work. So the start function is most likely uh, one of the internal routines that the C compiler adds. So the start function, we're not going to look at it in more detail, but the start function uh, sets up the heap and like performs some other initialization function, initialization steps that are necessary for the program to run, but they're not explicitly put there by, by the uh, programmer. Uh, however, uh, after all the initialization is done, it calls uh, the main function of the program, which in Windows programs it calls is, is named WinMain. So we're going to rename interesting func to WinMain because we've identified what it is. So yes. And there's a start procedure at mm -hmm. the header of every program. Yeah. And it ends by calling. Why wouldn't it just name what it calls you? Well, Ida, Ida is not that smart. I mean, Ida does name yeah. some functions yeah. but, based but on... Is that an unreasonable assumption on, on our part? Uh, yes, part? But, but also the start function mm -hmm. is... Uh, so Ida can name the start function because the entry point of the executable is uh, always... It, like it's, it, it's always recorded in the executable file. Okay. Uh, so Ida always knows where the executable starts, just like Windows knows where the executable starts when you launch it. But the start function, like its implementation, depends on the compiler. So in the Visual C compiler, the start function has one form, and then it calls WinMain. Uh, but in some other compiler, maybe there is no start function, or maybe the start function calls something else, and then that other function calls WinMain. So uh, you're, it's not always the same. 
Okay, so now we know the now we know where the win main uh, now we know where the win main function is. So great. So we can start reading the win main function, and uh, we can try to figure out what what it, what it, what it does. Um, close this. Okay. So usually what I do is uh, when I start looking at a function. I look at just the functions that it calls. Like I don't really read every single instruction. I just try to get a more high-level understanding of what happens in it, uh, like what 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 APIs it calls. Because often, based on that, you can guess what the goal of the function is. So uh, all the all the calls, all the function calls, are highlighted in blue. Uh, and then here we see a call to WSA startup. It is, it is followed by a call to socket. Then that is followed by some call to memset and so on. So um, there's two, two main points here. One, how did I don't know to name this function WSA startup? The answer is that's one of the functions that are imported from uh, the WinSock library and they're imported by name so the name is hard-coded in the executable uh, the same is true for the socket function if we have a call to a function that is not imported and Ida couldn't guess what it is then it, it's not going to have an understandable name but here we're lucky because most of the functions called by this program are simple uh, public APIs, Windows APIs, so we know what they do just by looking at their name. Uh, and then IDA has uh, a few more smarts that help us. So, for example, IDA knows that the parameters to the socket function are AF, type, and protocol. And uh, you, can, you can find out... Oh, I don't have that. If you Google the socket function and, you know, look up its reference, uh, you're going to see that it, these are these are its three arguments, and you can read the documentation on the socket function to understand what the arguments mean uh, and what they're for. Uh, Ida just knows that their their names are protocol type and AF. Uh, another important thing: when you call a function, its arguments are pushed onto the stack with a push instruction. Uh, so here we have push2, push1, push0, push EDI. Um, we have four pushes. So Ida knows that you know this push is the AF argument, this push is the type argument, this one is a protocol argument. Now the first push, the push EDI, uh, this one is not actually uh, an argument to the function because the function only has three arguments. So the fourth push is actually put there by the compiler to, to save the value of this register uh, so that later it can, be, it can be restored. So EDI is one of the registers that must be saved before you modify it. And then the function has to restore it when it returns. So the compiler saves it here and then at the bottom of the function it will it'll, it'll restore it from the saved value. Okay, so we have a call to, uh, we have a call to socket and if you go and look up what the actual constants mean, uh, here we're just creating a normal TCP socket. Then after this, uh, we get the return value. The return value of uh, functions is always returned in the EAX <coughs> register, which is here. So if we read the instructions after the call to socket, we see that the return value is moved into the EDI register and then we compare the EDI register with FFFFFFFFF which uh, is actually minus one in binary so you can yeah okay so we compare the return value of socket to minus one uh, this is simple error checking because socket returns minus one if it failed to create the socket and then we have a jump not zero uh, instruction. Uh, this instruction does a jump if the two values we compared are not, are, are not equal. So if socket did not return minus one, 
then we take the green the green branch and we continue here otherwise we take the red branch over there so now we know that this location where we jump to is the place where we go when the socket function succeeds since it returned a non uh, a value that's not minus one so we can rename that location so I'm gonna press the N uh, key which renames and we're gonna give it a more understandable name which is socket OK and you can see now that uh, Ida changed that name in the place where it's referenced and also the place uh, where it's the, the location that it specifies so we keep reading uh, we see we see a little bit more a few more calls uh, here we have a h2ns that's another standard API function it converts uh, it's usually used to convert port numbers so uh, its argument uh, which is here host short is most likely a port number and it's 7b6 uh, if I right click it I'll have the option to convert it to a decimal so it's 1974 so there we have port 1974 and then after this the program calls the bind function so it binds to port 1974 we continue reading uh, like all of these all of these jumps here are for error checking so if any errors happen we follow these branches but we're not interested in errors we want to find out what happens when the program succeeds so after we bind to this port we uh, listen on the socket so now the program uh, starts listening for connections and then whenever a connection happens we call uh, the program calls the accept function the accept function establishes the TCP connection and uh, returns a socket that we can read from and write to and we use this socket to communicate with the remote end of the connection so there is some client network client that connected to us on this port and it's gonna start sending and receiving data and we use the socket that accept returns to uh, read that data and to write to the to the client so it is important to keep track of that socket because the value that accept return that accept gives us is uh, the socket that has to be passed to any functions that are gonna read and write data from it now in this program it's a very simple program there's only one socket but in a more realistic program it's probably going to add. Uh, open multiple connections uh, it might listen to multiple ports so you have to kind of track which socket is connected to what port so the return value of uh, accept is the socket and it's that goes in EAX so we move it into ESI so now I'm going to add a comment and uh, you add the comment with the semicolon command <coughs> comment so the comment is going to say um, ESI equals socket or connected socket and you see that the comment appears in the disassembly so this makes it uh, easier for us to read through it and see what see, see what the meaning of these instructions is um, then we have a test instruction uh, test checks whether its argument is zero so we check if the ESI which is the socket if it's zero uh, which indicates a failure and if it's not zero we go here so we're gonna rename this uh, location uh, connection accepted and then we have three function calls here's the first one second one third one and if you look at ESI uh, which contains the socket you see that ESI is being pushed as an argument 
to each one of these three functions. So the program calls three functions with the socket as an argument. And then after this, it calls close socket, which anybody wants to guess what that does? Closes the socket. And then after the socket is closed, uh, the program continues. Uh, and you can see this big blue, uh, the big blue line that shows where the program goes after this. And it goes back to this, uh, back to this block here where we came from. So this blue line is actually a loop. So we have a loop that executes this block and then this block. And in the loop we call accept followed by these three functions that we haven't figured out yet and then we close the socket. So we're gonna rename this to connection loop. So now you know that the program goes in a loop accepts connections, and then it handles each connection through these uh, three functions. And then it finally closes the socket. So this is a very standard behavior for a uh, network server. We listen on a port, we accept connections, we handle them, and we repeat until the program terminates. So let's figure out what these functions do. Uh, we're going to look at the first one. Uh, we're going to name it first function, since we don't know exactly what it does, but it, we know that it's the first one. So we're going to incrementally, we're going to change its name based on, as we uncover more and more information about it. So for now, all we know is that it's the first one it's called. It receives one argument here, it's pushed, uh, push ESI, ESI is the connected socket. So it's one argument. It's one function with one. It's a function with one argument, the socket. So I'm going to click on it, and that will open the function. Now this function is just a single block. There's no conditionals. There's no loops. You know, just a single straight through block. So uh, let's let's read the uh, code and figure out what's uh, figure out what's going on. Um, does anyone have any idea what this function does based on the code there? That sounds about right. Um, we have two functions called by this function. Uh, one is strlen, and then we call send. So let's look at a send first. So we want to identify what arguments are pushed to it. So the first argument to send is uh, s. s is a local variable of this function. And Ida very helpfully identified that, uh, the, that, that the s argument is actually the first argument of this function. It even figured out its type, which is uh, pretty cool. Uh, it figured out the type because Ida knows that the send function accepts uh, an argument, that the first argument of the send function is supposed to be of type socket. And then Ida propagated the knowledge about this type uh, up. So um, that's how it figured out that the argument to our first func is of type socket. So we didn't really have to do that much reversing. Ida actually did you know, quite a bit by um, using its built-in knowledge. But in a more realistic scenario, uh, you're only going to have a few of those functions that Ida recognizes. Most of the other functions you're going to have to uh, figure out yourself. So uh, the uh, send function um, takes a socket. This is the socket that we just accepted a connection on. And then it takes a buffer and it takes a length. And the send function um, simply sends the contents of that buffer to the socket. Uh, let's see where the buffer comes from. The buffer is uh, pushed here. Uh, the ESI is the ESI register. 
So we need to look at where we where do we assign to the ESI register. So if we and I'm sure you've noticed, but you know whenever you click on a register or uh, fun or, or a function or anything else, Ida very helpfully highlights all the places where that register is uh, used. So we we have the ESI register being pushed here, and then if we look, if, if we go up, uh, we see that it's pushed again as an argument to Sterlin, and then here we have the assignment to into ESI. So we move into ESI, we move the offset of a variable called SDR, and this variable is a, a global, like global, global variable in the program. Um, it's actually not a variable, it's a constant because we never assign to it. Uh, it's in the data segment of the program. And its contents are a string called welcome to snow, uh, followed by percent uh, %n, percent %r, new line characters. And uh, again, uh, it looks like this because Ida was able to recognize that this looks like a string. It's like a null terminated C string. So it very helpfully converted it into string form. Um, if Ida couldn't, if, if it was not a string, if it was just like some kind of buffer of bytes, then Ida would have just shown you like a bunch of hex bytes, and then you would have had to figure out what the meaning of these hex bytes is. But since it's a string, uh, Ida figures it out. So we have the address of this string moved into uh, the ESI register. And then it's passed as an argument to Sterling and then it's passed as an argument to uh, send. Uh, if you look at the third argument to send, which is the EAX register, uh, this is supposed to be the length of the data that we're sending to the other end on the network connection. Um, the length is EAX, which is the return value of the Sterling function. So now the meaning, the, the, the intended, the operation of this function becomes more clear. Uh, we take this string constant, which says welcome to snow. We calculate its length with sterlen, and then we, uh, we, we give it to the send command, to the send function, to uh, send the contents of that string to, to the other party of the net, on the network. What is yeah. Oh, here? Uh, it's a little implementation detail. Um, Sterlen is a, a C function, so its calling convention is the C, uh, C decal calling convention. Um, you, can, you can read up on it. The C decal calling convention says that the caller pushes the arguments to the function, then calls the function, and then clears the arguments off the stack. So uh, the caller is this function. It pushes ESI, which is the argument of Sterling. And then when the Sterling returns, uh, the argument to Sterling is still on the stack because Sterling doesn't remove it from the stack. So this function has to remove it. And to remove something from the stack, you use the pop instruction, which just like pops it from the stack. And we pop it into ECX. Uh, because, like, we don't really care what its value is because, it, like, the value is irrelevant. We just want to pop something from the stack. So we just pop it into the ECX register. The ECX register is not used for anything else, so uh, we just use it as, like, scratch space. Okay. So that's why we pop the ECX. Uh, so, uh, one thing that I usually do when I do when I do uh, this kind of reversing is uh, I open up Notepad and I kind of type notes and I try to convert this function uh, the the assembly instructions to C code just because I find it easier to read. So if we wanted to guess, take a guess at what the C code of this function would look like, uh, it would be something like this. Um. 
So it would be it would be something something like this. Uh, we have this message. It's a string constant. We get its length with strlen, and then we call send, and uh, we pass the length to uh, send. So that's that's about it. Very simple, very simple function. How do you know it returns an int? Ida just guessed that it returns an int. Uh, yeah, here. Uh, yeah, so notice that so when send returns, its return value is an EAX. And then when our function returns, the value of EAX is still that return value. So this is equivalent to just returning the value that send returned. Uh, however, it is also possible that the this function doesn't really return a value like maybe it was a void function and then the value of send the return value of send is just discarded we can't really tell from the assembly code uh, we have to look at the at whoever calls this function and we'll have to see whether they check the return value if nobody checks the return value then most likely the function is a void function Okay. So, what should we name this function? I mean, now we kind of understand what it does. So, uh, tell me, what do we what do we name it that reflects its uh, meaning? Hmm? Welcome. Welcome, Funk. So it's a good name. So now when we, uh, oh, I just pressed escape, which moves you back one level. So this is the, this is the win main function. Uh, so we have a call to welcome func, uh, and we know what it does. It sends a welcome message. Maybe we can call it send welcome message to be like even more, even more explicit. So now let's move on to the uh, second function. Now the second function has uh, so the second function here has two parameters. First one is uh, still ESI, which is uh, our connected socket. The second parameter, however, is EAX, which is calculated using the LEA instruction. LEA stands for Load Effective Address. Um, <coughs> it's not really important what it stands for. Uh, it's important what it does. LEA calculates the uh, address of a variable. So in, in, in C speak, it would be equivalent to the ampersand operator. So here we have a local variable called var124. Uh, and then the LEA instruction, the LEA instruction takes the address of var124 and puts it in EAX. And then uh, we push this as an argument to second func. So if we wanted to put a comment after second func to make it clear what happens it would be it would be called kind of like this s and then app bar one two four so we have a cult second func with these two arguments uh, what is var one two four we don't know it's just a local variable in the stack uh, we have no idea what its name is or what its type is yes what is what the Ah, okay. So uh, when 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 you enter a function, the function uh, sets up its uh, stack frame, which is uh, which is it res it reserves some space on the stack for all of its local variables, and then it uses 
the EBP register to point to that stack frame. Uh, EBP stands for base pointer. So it points to the, uh, it points to the area of the stack that is, that, that is used for local variables. And because you have multiple local variables in, in, in the same function, uh, it addresses each one, it refers to each one uh, by adding a value to EBP. So EBP kind of points to the beginning of that area, and then depending on what uh, offset you add to it, you're referring to different functions. Uh, sorry, to different variables. So uh, that's, uh, you're going to see the EBP addressing uh, pretty often in most, in most C code. Okay, so uh, let's go into second func and try to figure out what it does. So IDA, uh, the second function is, is uh, of type socket, and then but it doesn't know what the type of the second argument is, so it just says integer. Uh, but uh, that's most likely wrong. IDA just doesn't know. But we can correct this once you figure out once we figure out what the type is. So let's look at the code. The code is a little bit more complicated, but again, if we focus on the functions that are being called we see that first we uh, call the receive function which reads from the uh, which reads from the network and then the arguments to receive are s which is the socket then uh, a buff argument that's the buffer that we read into so we read from the network and store it into this buffer uh, and then this buffer is uh, this argument is the address of a local variable called buff. Uh, and then again, Ida was smart. It knows that uh, this variable is being passed to receive as the second argument, so that's why it called it buff. Uh, if it didn't know what its name should be, it would have called it var underscore some number. Okay, so we have buff, which is a buffer, a buffer uh, on the stack. And then uh, we have len which is how many bytes we're reading from the network. We're reading one byte. So this receive, uh, this receive function reads one byte from the network into buff. And buff is a character buffer. So we read one byte from the network. What happens after that? We do some other stuff, and then I'm going to skip through a few of the less important pieces. Uh, but then we have a loop here. So the loop is identified by like this big, uh, dark, dark uh, blue line. So we have a loop. So the remaining function is the loop. So it reads one byte, and then it goes into a loop. In the loop, it reads from the buff variable it, and it puts it into the AL register. The AL register is a single byte register. So this basically takes the byte that we just read and puts it into AL. AL equals byte just read from the network. And then we compare this byte with, uh, the, with, with the number D. Uh, the number D is actually the new line character. Is it? It's either new line or line feed. feed. Uh, I think it's new line. Line feed? OK. So then the comment for this would be, is the byte equal to line feed. And then the conditional, this conditional jump here jumps if they're equal. So byte is line feed. 
Whoa. I think it didn't like the uh, name being starting with byte. Okay, so if the byte is a line feed, we like jump somewhere down there. But if it's not a line feed, then we do another comparison and we check if it's a new line. So we go here, is the byte equal to a new line? And if it is, the jz command jumps here. Byte is new line. Okay, so what happens if the byte is a new line? We go to this block. And this block is the end of the function. We return. So it seems like this function reads from the network. And then if it reads a new line character, it returns. So most likely this is a loop that keeps reading bytes from the network until it reaches a new line. Again, this is a very common thing for a network server to do. You're just reading, reading some command, uh, and then when you hit the new line, that's the end. So what happens if it's not a new line, if it's just a regular character, let's say A? We take the character, which was the byte, which was in the AL register, and we move it into uh, the memory at address ESI plus EDI. So here we're computing the address and storing the byte at that address. So what are ESI and EDI? Uh, let's look at where they're assigned. So the assignment to ESI starts here. Uh, where we XOR ESI with ESI. What happens when you XOR this when you XOR two numbers that are the same? Sorry? Yes. So when you XOR two bytes that are the same, you get result zero. So the XOR ESI ESI instruction is actually equivalent to ESI equals zero. It's an assignment. Why does the compiler do XOR ESI ESI instead of you know doing a move instruction to assign a zero? It's uh, faster and uh, it's also smaller because the XOR instruction is uh, I think one or two bytes uh, but then the move would be longer so it's a little optimization. So ESI starts as zero And then it's being used here for our address. And then immediately it gets incremented. So ESI is actually a counter in the loop because on each iteration of the loop, we increment it by one. Uh, so we can actually rename ESI to counter. So that's kind of crazy. IDA lets you rename registers. Uh, I don't use it very often, but in this case, it makes the code a little bit simpler. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. Well, you don't really have to rename registers very often. You can always just put a comment that explains what uh, what the register is. So here we have. We increment the counter. Uh, so the equivalent in C would be counter plus plus. And then here we are uh, storing at an address that's EDI plus counter. So EDI is probably a buffer. And then counter would be an array index into that, into that buffer. Uh, <coughs> this, is, this is like a very, very common pattern. So in C, it's probably equivalent to something like EDI counter equals AL, where EDI is uh, just a uh, array, array of, array of bytes. So let's look at where EDI comes from. So we have EDI highlighted. 
we go up a little bit, and we see that EDI is assigned arg4. arg4 is uh, actually the second argument to the function. This is how Ida names arguments. So uh, let's rename this argument to a buffer argument. Buff arg. And as I renamed it, uh, Ida immediately updated the prototype of the function up here. So now the function takes buff arg. Uh, and then I'm going to put a comment here that says EDI equals buff arg. Okay, so now we know that the function takes a socket and a buffer, and then EDI refers to that buffer. And then inside the loop, uh, we are reading bytes, storing them into that buffer, and incrementing a counter. So it turned out that the uh, code of this function, that the operation of this function is very, is actually pretty simple. It just reads bytes and stores them in a buffer. Uh, and then after we read, after we store the byte into the buffer, uh, we go to this block down here where we call receive again. So it is truly a loop that keeps iterating, uh, reading bytes into a buffer until we hit a uh, new line character. So there's another cool thing that you can do in Ida here. Um, I think it's edit. Uh, it's the Y key. I don't know what the command is in the menu. Uh, the Y key lets you change the prototype, which uh, allows you to, uh, to, to set the types of the arguments. So we now know that, this, uh, that the second argument is not an integer. The second argument is a uh, pointer to a character buffer. So we're going to change its uh, type, and now everything looks nice. So we kind of figured out what this function does, right? So in summary, you call the function, you pass it a buffer, and it just reads from the socket until into that buffer until it hits new line. Uh, there is a security bug in this function. Can anyone tell me what the security bug is? Uh, yes. So this function, the loop in this function, it keeps going until it receives a new line uh, from, from the network. But what if we keep sending A's and no new line? Like we can send 100 megabyte of A's, no new line. Uh, the code will just keep iterating through the loop and increment the counter every time right into the buffer. So it will fill the buffer and then it will continue writing past the end of the buffer. This is what's known as a buffer overflow. And uh, they're, 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 they're pretty common and uh, pretty cool because it turns out you can exploit them to actually take full control of the uh, application. Um, I think there's going to be some more, um, there's going to be other, other sessions that are going to talk about the exploitation in more detail. Uh, so let's see what this buffer is that we're writing into. Uh, I'm going to go to the place where second func is called. Oh, before that, what should we call this function? Huh? <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to call it read from socket into buffer. So this is the place where it's called, uh, and you see that because we changed the name of that argument inside the function, Ida propagated that name. So in the caller, now we have buff arg listed here, and then the var1234 
variable, Ida automatically renamed to buff arg. So it's, uh, it's very smart, like the propagation of names and types is uh, pretty cool. So um, this, is the, this is the buffer that is being passed to, to that function. So where is that buffer? Well, the buffer is a local variable inside the win main function. And we know this because uh, in the win main function, we get the address of, uh, we get the address of this variable and we refer to it by uh, offsetting from EBP. And since EBP is the, f is, is the base pointer that points to the local <coughs> stack frame, this means that the buffer is on the local stack frame. So uh, with our newfound knowledge, we, 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 find, we, we figured out a security bug in this program. So the program listens on a port accepts the connection, sends a welcome message, and then just reads from the network whatever you send it. So if you send it a, uh, if you send it, you know, a message that's too long, longer than the buffer, uh, it will uh, override the buffer and corrupt memory past the end of the buffer. So the one remaining thing is to figure out how long this buffer is. So here's how to do this. We're going to go to the beginning of the function, at the top. Uh, this is where IDA lists all the local variables that it has identified. So here's the local variables. So it lists uh, the names, their types, if it knows what they are, and then also the offset from EBP. So EBP is the base pointer. Uh, the buff arg variable it starts at EBP minus 124. Uh, you can see that the next variable that Ida found starts at offset EBP minus 24. So this means that the difference in the addresses of the two variables is uh, what? You're an instructor. You can't answer these questions. Uh, You'll, you'll, you'll get a chance to impress them when you're up here. Too complicated. <laughs> okay, well, I'll do this and then I'll show you the stack view. So, by, by, by uh, subtracting these two numbers, we see that the difference between buff arg and the next variable on the stack is uh, uh, one zero zero, but that's a hex number. So one zero zero in hex is two fifty six. So we have a two fifty six byte buffer uh, in win main, and then we're reading into it uh, an unlimited amount of bytes. So that's the uh, that's the buffer overflow. Uh, now the stack view that uh, Aaron mentioned, uh, you can get there if you uh, double click on any of these variables. And it opens a new window here, that call, it's called stack of win main. And this, 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 this view shows you exactly what the stack would look like at runtime. Um, so when you call a function, you push its arguments on the stack, and then you do the call instruction, which pushes the return address, and then jumps to that function. So this is how the function knows where to return. The, the return address is pushed uh, onto the stack together with the arguments. And on the bottom here, we see the arguments. So these are the arguments to win main. If you've done any Windows programming in C, you'll actually recognize these uh, variable names. These are the standard argument names of the win main function. Then we have this thing R, which is the return address. That's what Ida calls it. Uh, then we have this thing S. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's uh, used to save the old frame pointer. You don't have to be concerned with it. And then after this, we start with uh, various uh, variables that are, that, that, that are referenced inside the function body. So we have the adder len variable, we have the adder variable, we have DST. We have two other variables that Ida could not 
could not identify, uh, we can go and manually, you know, see where they're referenced and try to understand the code. But for our purposes, uh, that's irrelevant because our goal was to understand not all of the not all of the program, but enough of its code to be able to do something interesting with it. Uh, and now we now that we know where the buffer overflow is, we can trigger it. Uh, we can write a network client program that connects to this port, sends the data, triggers the buffer overflow. We don't need to know all the details of every single function. Um, so let's crawl up to where buff arg is. So here's buff arg, and you see that uh, Ida uh, shows it like up here, and then dd means that it's a double double word, and then after that it's followed by dbs, which are bytes. Uh, so Ida has all of these uh, all of these bytes on the on the stack frame, and it doesn't know what they are because there's no references directly to them. That's why they don't have any names. Now, the reason there's no references to them is because uh, all the uses of buff arg happen through its main, th through its base address. So the program takes the address of buff arg uh, and never refers to the individual bytes inside it. But buff arg is an array of uh, a bunch of bytes. So that's why you have all of these uh, unidentified bytes here. They're simply part of the buffer, uh, but because Ida doesn't know that this is a 256 byte buffer, it doesn't it doesn't fold up the bytes into it. So uh, if we scroll down, you know, there's going to be 256 of these bytes, and then we're going to have the next uh, next variable, which is here. Uh, it's called adder adder. So this is how we know that. Uh, this is how we know that buff adder is actually a 256 byte array uh, because we can count these bytes and we'll see that there's 256 of them. Uh, now, it is theoretically possible that buff adder is actually not a character array. Maybe it's a structure that contains a character array of 256 bytes followed by uh, this adder field. There is no way of us, no way for us to know, because uh, we don't have any type information. We just have to guess the types. So the programmer might have put these two things into a structure, uh, or they might have been two separate variables. Uh, in the in the assembly code, it's going to look exactly the same. So uh, because of that, we have to guess what would make more sense, and. Uh, you do this based on experience, you do this based on having seen a bunch of C code, knowing you know, what code usually looks like and how you would write it. So if you had to write a program that implemented a network server, server and read from the network into a buffer, you would probably put the buffer as just a normal variable in the stack. You're not going to put it in some kind of more complicated structure. So we're going to guess that this is what the programmer did. Uh, but there is no way to know for sure. So the types that you identify might not match exactly what was in the original C code, but uh, they're, 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 the behavior of the program is going to match because the behavior implemented in the assembly is exactly what gets executed. So I've talked for quite a while. Um, hopefully this will give you enough uh, enough information to like start and you can take um, you can take some program like a very simple program load it up into IDA um, and you can try to sort of repeat these steps uh, see what the program does. Um, I think we can put this program on the on the website so you can actually download this very same executable and just kind of repeat these uh, steps as an exercise. Um, and those skills are going to be pretty useful uh, later when you try to uh, exploit, um, exploit some programs and you know, when you try to figure out what the internal layout 
of, uh, of a program is. So I think that's all, that's all I have for today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let me know now. Um, you can also always email me at my email address that was on the first slide. I think we'll put it on the website as well.